Welcome everyone to the Homeless Prevention Strategies webinar as part of IGH Community of Impact webinar series. Today we have four panelists speaking about prevention programs in their communities and research throughout the world. Um, our speakers are Abe Outshorn from Western University, Lynette Barnes, who leads All Chicago's Emergency Financial Assistance Program, and Katie Schomacher and Melissa Matthews from Byron Child Youth and Families Geelong Project. We're excited to have them with us um, and also to be exploring this important topic. So um, for this webinar, you can join the conversation online by tweeting the hashtags IGHCOI and hashtag homelessness. There is also many ways that you can engage with the Ref Institute of Global Homelessness. You can follow us on social media, subscribe to our newsletter on our website, and then also join our Community of Impact. Our Community of Impact has um, a series of webinars on a curated list of topics. And then we also have resource guides with relevant um, research and tools as a supplement. So in choosing this webinar, um, we really th thought about what are integral parts of homeless systems and programs. And as if everyone knows, um, traditionally homeless programs um, are geared to, to people that are already experiencing homelessness, but there is a growing evidence that indicates um, that prevention strategies help communities reduce the number of people entering the homeless system and um, help reduce the incidence overall. So in forming prevention strategies, it's very crucial to look at the causes of homelessness in one's community and to create targeted prevention strategies that address these causes. So this graphic just has a few um, commonly found causes of homelessness, including unemployment, um, discharge from the carceral system or from um, hospitals, um, people that are aging out of child welfare systems, and also the impact of racism and colonialism and other forms of discrimination. And we also have um, many bouts of homelessness that are resulted from evictions and a lack of affordable housing. And in um, forming um, prevention strategies, it's, you know, it's important to understand the inflow in order to drive change and to disrupt um, the, the inflow into homelessness. And it's also important to ensure that um, everyone has equitable access to prevention programs and to services um, to ensure true effectiveness of programs. So in defining prevention, um, all prevention programs aim to stop or at least reduce the inflow into homeless services and systems. Um, and they help individuals and families maintain housing stability so these are just a sample of um, commonly found prevention programs. So we have permanent vouchers or housing subsidies to help with rental payments, short-term financial assistance for people that are at risk of eviction, providing landlord and tenant mediation to prevent eviction. And then also um, we're using assessments and screenings um, to identify risk factors and then to follow up with people at risk with case management and support. And then a variety of community-based services such as education, jobs placement, and um, benefits enrollment. And um, many communities and countries throughout the world are using different prevention and um, looking into prevention strategies. In Canada, they developed a ty ty typology um, with um, categorizing five different forms of prevention services, including structural systems, early intervention, evictions prevention, and housing stability. In Finland, um, they had dedicated teams that advised people about to lose their homes, and they were able to prevent evictions um, by, by half um, from 2008 to 2016. In Germany and the UK, their government-led prevention programs led to measurable reductions in homelessness. In Newcastle, the city worked upstream to identify and support people at risk, preventing 24,000 households from becoming homeless. In Santiago, Chile, 
um, and local nonprofit uses um, support services, including social integration, psychosocial services, and skills training in order to prevent homelessness. And in Los Angeles, a group of researchers from UCLA and the University of Chicago use predictive analytics to understand who is at most risk of homelessness. And they found that um, in serving the top 1% of people that are most at risk would reduce 6,900 um, new spells of homelessness. So I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, um, Abe Outshorn. And Abe Outshorn is an assistant professor in the School of Nursing at Western University in Canada. Abe is the managing editor of the International Journal on Homelessness and a founding member of the Center for Research on Health Equity and Social Inclusion. And there was a slight problem in the recording, and so we lost the first few seconds of Abe speaking. So I apologize for the jump in audio. Um, and opportunity, at least, for you know communities that uh, that have seen some preliminary success with Housing First, perhaps, um, but uh, but now are finding you know the housing market tapped out even for those options. And I'm really looking for, uh, as Julia referred to, those upstream approaches. So again, that's the framework for homelessness prevention out of, uh, out of Canada on the Homeless Hub. And so in terms of uh, things that are going well for some research in Canada um, that, uh, that I'm familiar with through some colleagues of mine is thinking about the different ways that uh, different folks access services and the fact that it, it's a very different experience with you know someone who may be already sleeping rough uh, or in an urban encampment who is then moving into to some health uh, or social housing service versus others who move um, you know, from, from one system to another uh, or directly from being housed into homelessness. And so these different journeys offer different potential. And so one of the ones that we've picked up on in, in my own community of London is around families. And so where, you know, single adults often just show up into the system. So if we're thinking about shelters, for example, uh, single adults might just show up that evening, get the, uh, look for a bed for the night. Uh, with families, because of even just the complexities of, of transportation and kids, uh, they're much more likely to call ahead into the shelter system, for example. Uh, and so for us, that was a real clue that there's a, a diversionary moment uh, or opportunity that arises with families that doesn't necessarily arise with other uh, individuals. And so all of our family shelters have started uh, integrating into, you know, their normal call uh, workers who, instead of just saying, you know, is there, is there room tonight or not, uh, are, have been trained up on diversion. And so they're able to have the conversation with folks about where they're staying now. And are they able to help them to uh, maintain a, state, a safe housing? Uh, so whether that's, that's staying where they are and then maybe you know, they, they need some financial assistance or is it helping move them uh, somewhere else that maybe isn't the shelter? Um, so that's one example. Another example, and, and Julia mentioned there's, there's many systems that actually unfortunately feed into homelessness. And so another example we've been uh, looking at in, in our community is discharge to no fixed address from hospital. And where we are finding that happening most often was in long-term mental health inpatient. And so, again, there's a real opportunity there because of the length of stay involved. Um, you know, discharge from a medicine unit to no fixed address, that can be very hard because stays in medicine might be very short. Uh, but in our inpatient mental health, folks were having, you know, multi-week, multi-month, and even some of them multi, unfortunately, year stays. And so in, in that context, there's a lot more opportunity to do house uh, uh, planning. And, and so we've actually been able to tap into 
uh, the tools developed around housing first around uh, what it means to be paper ready uh, to, to get into housing and build those same processes into inpatient mental health care so that folks are doing things like getting their identification sorted out while they're still in hospital, uh, seeking references for housing, uh, ensuring that there's going to be income upon exit, um, and, and all those elements of, of paper readiness for housing. Um, so that, that that exit from hospital uh, is in to, to home. So those are a couple, couple of promising practices. So again, I would invite you to think about in your community, um, the very particular different pathways that different populations have. Uh, because we, you know, we can throw up our hands and say, you know, if, if we think about the experience, it's all the same. It's like, oh, well, well how, how do we divert people? People just show up at shelter, but that might not be everyone that has that uh, exact way that they show up into services. So think about the particularities of your populations and how you might find diversionary moments in that. Uh, another one that I wanted to, to briefly touch on it, and, and really I don't want to take Lynette's thunder on this because I know she's the, the, the expert on this work, but in terms of, of financial supports, uh, what I did just want to mention is, is to put this into to scale, really. And uh, Unfortunately, we still sometimes encounter that barrier where governments say that uh, rent banks are not a precise approach. And what they mean by that is if you take the spectrum of folks who are in a financial crisis around their rent, the majority will actually solve that situation on their own, right? And so, giving money from a rent bank might be imprecise because we might be actually giving money to someone who would otherwise figure that situation out on their own. Uh, and that's unfortunate because, you know, it becomes an argument against helping those who, who wouldn't have been able to, to figure that out. So, so how do I speak to our folks uh, and our decision makers in my community about um, uh, rent supports? It, it's around the cost. And to me, this is where, where the argument is so clear. Even if we are giving, ending up giving support to folks who in the end wouldn't have needed it, the difference between a rent support and what it costs to build a new housing unit is just so astronomically different. For us in uh, the Canadian context, we're looking at $135,000 per unit to build mid to high density new affordable housing. So if you take any single individual or family group and you say, what's it going to cost to keep people where they are versus if we have to provide a new housing option for them. And so even if we use rent supports in a very broad way, uh, and we're looking at arrears of $200, $500, $700, maybe some damages, some utility arrears. Uh, it still gets you nowhere close to the cost of what it builds, uh, what it takes to build new affordable housing options. Uh, and so that's the argument uh, that we take is you're always best spending money to keep people in the housing that they're in, as long as that housing, of course, is safe, sufficient, adequate. Uh, and, and decent. So the finally thing that the final thing that I, I really wanted to to point to um, is in the typology that I mentioned, the Canadian typology. Uh, there's one concept that I've actually added uh, recently to that in a in a paper, and that's the concept of empowerment. And so. If we think about how do we prevent particularly cycles of homelessness, unfortunately, where our systems are um, unkind, where our systems remove choice, where our systems have processes of institutionalizing people, then we also end up setting people up for failure down the line. Uh, and so that's why when I think about prevention, 
I think it's vital that we think about our systems as always creating a context for people to empower themselves uh, because that uh, core will help prevent future crises uh, and it will ensure uh, that people are uh, respected, are uh, achieving dignity um, and are able to manage future uh, challenges in their lives. Uh, so to that end, uh, I did want to just close my brief comments by thinking about if we think about the idea of empowerment and we think about homelessness prevention, what does this mean as we move beyond maybe high income countries, right? So I've seen we've got representation here from Europe, from North America, from Australia. The issues around homelessness prevention uh, are are quite a bit different than what we might see in other countries around the world. And so why I center this on empowerment is because I believe that the struggle to prevent homelessness is tied in with so many other struggles around rights. And so if we think about what does it mean to prevent homelessness in Accra in Ghana, well, that mean, might mean the right to land. And so where you have 25% of the urban population living in, in temporary structures, then preventing homelessness means not moving them off of the land that they're currently occupying. Uh, I think about what is preventing homelessness look like in Saudi Arabia, where there's a huge migrant workforce who are housed by their employers, but under very strict conditions where they're only allowed to leave that housing with supervision uh, to go to the workplace. Uh, and it's uh, where they are, are constricted to that uh, occupancy and that occupancy is lost if the employment is lost. And so there, homelessness prevention is tied to labor rights. And then what does homelessness look like uh, in so many other nations where the fight is for gender equality. And so if only men own land, if only men own housing, property, um, then ending homelessness means changing that so that, that women have the equal rights to land, to ownership, to housing. And so the struggles around gender equality, around uh, safe employment laws around land ownership are all part of the struggle for homelessness prevention. Uh, and so that's kind of what I wanted to highlight uh, for my work. Uh, so a couple local examples, thinking about empowerment in all of the work that we do uh, to set up people for long futures of successful housing tendencies and recognizing that the struggle to prevent homelessness is also tied in with a whole variety of struggles for human rights. Thank you. Thanks, Abe, um, so much for your comments. And you know, I think it's so critical to understand, you know, the the reasons for, for homelessness in the individual countries, and to really um, have individual have have approaches that meet that, which is including addressing um, discrimination. And, and land rights issues. And th those were great things to um, think about and kind of learn more about. And we'll, we'll, I think we uh, included the, the, your new research in, in the comments and I encourage everyone to go read it. I read it yesterday. Um, so for our next um, panelist is Lynette Barnes. And Lynette is the Director of Emergency Financial Assistance for Chicago's Continuum of Care Homelessness Collaborative, All Chicago. Um, Lynette Barnes joined the Emergency Fund as a program coordinator in March 2007. And prior to joining the Emergency Fund, Lynette worked with economically disadvantaged, unemployed and underemployed clients for 22 years at the Chicago Urban League. In addition, Lynette served as a partner agency liaison for the Emergency Fund for five years. Lynette holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration from Chicago State University. Thanks um, so much for joining us, Lynette. 
Ooh, thank you so much um, for having me. You make me sound so important there. Thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Um, Abe gave me so much to think about. I was just in, 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 engrossed in what he was saying and how uh, to the point that is with uh, prevention and um, thinking about you know empowerment and, and education when it comes to um, prevention and seeing how this has changed over the years and where we want to go in the future to try to as much as possible eliminate um, or at least get an understanding of how prevention and how homelessness has uh, escalated over the years. I um, was speaking before the webinar talking about doing a little research on how the state homeless prevention program uh, began in Illinois. And um, it wasn't really until 1993 that these funds uh, became available because people just weren't looking at homeless prevention as being a major problem, which is just astonishing to me that it was geared mainly for supportive services for people that may have been low income or at risk of homelessness, but it was looked at more that we needed more transitional housing and we needed more employment services. And we've kind of come full service in my um, circle, in my opinion, to really needing those things again, to look at the root causes of homelessness. Um, the All Chicago Making Homelessness History program didn't start out as a homeless prevention program. It started out um, in 1973. Norman H. Stone, the founder, was a businessman and uh, he discovered that many people that actually worked for him were working poor, that they were uh, one paycheck away from being homeless. And so he joined forces with some of his business uh, partners to create an emergency fund to help people with things like emergency food. He saw no need for people to have to stand in long lines to get basic necessities or fill out 20 page applications um, to do that. And, and that is kind of the uh, cornerstone of all Chicago. And so it wasn't until um, 2015, when we merged with the Chicago Alliance to End Homelessness, they were doing great advocacy work and uh, working with bringing in um, more federal dollars through the continuum of care created by uh, HUD. And we joined forces with them to create All Chicago Making uh, Homelessness History. But we always kept the cornerstone of the emergency fund, which is geared to small uh, amounts of assistance to prevent larger crisis from happening. And I think that is very important in, in homelessness prevention because if someone finds a job and doesn't have transportation assistance to get to that job until they earn their first paycheck, where do they go? Most government programs for homeless prevention won't provide assistance for transportation or for good faith payment for utility assistance or for uniform for clothing. So um, that program is still vital um, in our communities here. So I, I, I often go back to that when we're having discussions about how to have kind of a, a, a root discussion on homelessness prevention. Where did it start? How did we get here? How did we get back to basic fundamentals of uh, preventing homelessness. Um, and now with the pandemic, that has created even more challenges. So uh, in this last year, we have looked at more of our eviction diversion uh, programs. How, how do we prevent households from having an eviction filed against them? Just the filing of an eviction could prevent someone from getting adequate housing, uh, whether they worked it out with their landlord or not. 
So we partner with the Lawyers Committee for Better Housing and different legal services. And part of the recovery money that's coming in now would be specifically for evictions. Um, we're also looking at more landlord engagement um, in order to work with landlords to secure units so that um, we could take some of the households and participants or individuals that were encampments and try to move them quickly through our rapid rehousing program. So there are a lot of different inroads that, that we have, but we are still seeing that technology is, is playing a big part in homelessness uh, uh, prevention. And, you know, just having access, you know, it's still a big issue for someone that is in their 70s or 80s that just does not know how to navigate the system to provide online applications. So we're looking at partnering with more agencies that can provide that kind of support to get applications um, completed and, and things like that. Uh, our system right now, uh, individuals are able to access a 311 call center and ask for short-term help where they're directed to an information and referral specialist that will guide them through what the process looks like and then they can be referred to one of our partners or they can go directly to one of our partners for assistance. Um, and then All Chicago is responsible for reviewing the application to make certain that all documentation is provided and that they are able to um, complete the application and receive payment directly to their landlord, vendors, real, real estate people, what have you. Um, so I did want to leave the majority of my time, hopefully, for question and, and, and answers. It's so much rich history, so many things that were going on, but um, I did want to just let everyone know that uh, last year for 2020, we were able to uh, serve over uh, 3,000 households and distribute close to $8 million. And this was not part of some of the special funds that came through because of COVID-19. Uh, we're still working on some of those, those programs, but I'd be happy to um, answer any questions that I can about our process or, you know, but we, what we do to try to end homelessness here in Chicago. Thanks so much, Lynette. And I think, um, as you said, the, the, the emergency fund and the programs you support have had such an enormous impact, um, which is, you know, especially important right now during COVID, but, you know, now is important to address housing um, stability and really address the root causes of homelessness and provide that support. Um, we're going to be answering questions after um, our next panelist, so I encourage everyone to um, to put their questions in the Q and A or in the chat, whatever is easiest, and then we'll make sure to um, ask those questions um, and right after our next panelist. Um, so, um, so I'm going to um, introduce um, our final kind of prevention work. So the, um, our panelists for the Geelong project in Australia are gonna be joining us to answer questions, but um, to better explain their work and the work um, in addressing youth homelessness, I'm gonna be sharing um, a video about the Geelong project. So um, it works to prevent youth homelessness uh, by working in schools and assessing um, youth for the risk of homelessness and providing early interventions um, through monitoring and case management. Um, through their um, interim report that was um, sent out in 2018, they found that the project had a 40% reduction in youth homelessness and a 20% reduction in dropouts. And um, Feel free to put your questions about the project in the chat um, while I show this short video. So 
sorry about that. I'm just going to make sure I shared it correctly. And just before. So school. So you spoke to your biology teacher. That's great. Yeah. Well, and that's also really good because you're seeing that that's sort of something that was really hard for you to do too. Youth homelessness in Australia is just a, such a massive issue and there just has to be something to be done to stop it. We deal with young people presenting at like the youth entry point, which is where someone would go if they were homeless. They're already in crisis. And so that opportunity for that early intervention is gone. We're trying to stop that homelessness or that family breakdown. So we're getting in as early as we can. Accessing young people in the biggest setting within a community, it's gotta be a school. I'm an early intervention response worker for the Geelong Project, working with young people who are at secondary school but are at risk of disengaging from school or at risk of homelessness or sort of showing signs of mental health impacting their school engagement, family life, that kind of thing. There's a whole lot of youth services in the region that were really crisis driven. Before the Geelong Project there was no significant early intervention programs. A common, I guess, misconception of what homelessness is, is rough sleeping, so people sleeping outside, which obviously is the real pointy end of homelessness. What we've seen is homelessness also includes young people who couch surf, which means that they go from either one family's house or a friend's house to another friend's house to another friend's house for maybe short periods of time. And that's where a lot of young people go to if they don't live at home. We work mostly with the underlying issues. Some of the things that I see pretty regularly is family violence or family conflict, depression and anxiety, financial hardship. The housing crisis, particularly in Geelong, housing hasn't increased over the last 20 years. We've stayed with the same amount of housing options as what we had 20 years ago. There's been a huge population growth with lots of people coming down from Melbourne and lots of new estates and housing being built. The gentrification, that's sort of what's going on in Geelong at the moment. I believe it became a crisis when it became more public. The Geelong newspaper and the media portrayed a couple of families living in cars and questioning in today's modern world, is that a way for a family to live? And the price of housing going higher and the accessibility to public housing becoming more complex, rather than waiting for it to get to the stage where the stories were for how many do you have in your neighbourhood, it actually became, isn't one too many. I'm the principal at uh, Northern Bay College's Goldsworthy campus, which focuses on year nine to 12. The community here is one that uh, is probably typified, if you take government speak, at being low socioeconomic. For some, they were involved with industry that's closed in Geelong. Families fell out of work. Some have been out of work for more than a generation. We also have a large number of Australian First Peoples that live in the neighbourhood and their needs and the way we approach that was also to be considered for their cultural safety and awareness. Of our 1,600 students, we would have probably 500 from a culturally and linguistic diverse community and probably 32 different languages being spoken in that space. A lot of people in this neighbourhood talk about being done to rather than done with. And I think there's a real mentality with the Geelong Project to ensure that it was built from the ground upwards. It's something that's not a service, it's actually a project that keeps evolving and you really got to tailor it to the individual schools, not one size fits all. We've had to really adapt to what the school is wanting, how we can work with the school. What we have is a survey that goes out to the schools. All the students do it at the school. The survey asks things like, have you stayed at home last week? Did you spend any nights away from home? one night, three nights, more than three. Through having access to that information, we're able to identify students that could potentially benefit from some of that early intervention. On Tuesdays and Thursdays for like the whole day, I'll be out at Goldsworthy, which is one of the Northern Bay campuses. The most important thing about the beginning of the day is coming in and just saying hello and chatting to the wellbeing team, getting a feel for what's been going on and having a bit more of an understanding of where the school's at or if there's been any incidents or anything that's occurred with any of the young people I'm working with. 
It's giving whoever you're working with a space where they can talk and be open and honest and reflective about what they're actually going through. Like we're not teachers, we're not an authoritative role, we're not a parent. We're sort of just someone that's just there for that young person and whatever they want. That's just a series of lots of little things that hopefully build up. So how are you feeling about getting through year 11 right now? Yeah, good. And I think what's really good is that you did a lot of that. Do you feel like your mum understands you a little bit more better? So good, because I remember like when I first met you, I think you were like, I'm not, I don't even think I'll stay at home until the end of this year. I reckon I'll be moved out before the end of the year. And now look at you. We've noticed that we've had a 40% reduction rate in young people coming through our youth entry point that are in that school leavers age bracket. We've also seen a 20% decrease in young people leaving school, which is a massive thing it's unheard of. So I'll be back at school on Thursday, if you want to catch up again then. As long as you're safe and happy, that's the most important things. The thing with early intervention, it's not a quick fix. It's something that is quite slow. It's taken six years for us to see that real big deduction in young people coming through Youth Entry Point. I think the Geelong project, their, their goals are honourable to, to make sure people don't become homeless, to make sure they remain engaged in school. Because the alternative is to see a large you know, generation of young people leave without a sense of purpose and optimism. Every young person we work with is completely different and their story is completely different and why they're working with us is completely different. I hate that some young people don't have anywhere to go and just everybody should get a chance. So I'm going to um, turn it over to IGH's executive director. Maybe Okay, I think. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll turn it <laughs> Are we all good, Julia? I, I should start now. Yes, yes, thank you, Lydia. Sorry Great. about that. <laughs> no problem. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Lydia Stays, and I'm the executive director of the Ruff Institute of Global Homelessness. And it's my privilege to be able to facilitate the question and answer um, portion of this um, conversation. So I'm going to ask all of our panelists to come off their, um, come on, put their videos on. I think that will help us uh, have, a, have a better conversation. Um, and so you all have some leading experts on homelessness prevention here on the webinar for, for you all to learn from. So um, I'm hoping that the chat function and the question and answer function start to explode with, with questions. Um, so we heard three really different approaches to homelessness prevention through the webinar today. First, we heard from Abe about the research that he's led in Canada and um, you know the importance of really looking at your own countries or communities context to understand why people are becoming homeless and to tailor your homelessness prevention strategies to your community. I think that's a really important point that we don't want to lose. Um, we heard from Lynette about the, the power that relatively small amounts of emergency financial assistance can play to kind of break that cycle of crisis that families or individuals find themselves in, um, you know, on the, on the brink of homelessness and can really kind of cut that cycle short and keep them stably housed. Um, and then we heard from the incredible Geelong Project and, you know, how they're working kind of upstream into schools with um, students and young people who are, are homeless. And again, I thought the point in that video about um, tailoring the program to each individual school is really important when you think about success. So I think, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet here uh, when we think about homelessness prevention. And it's more about understanding our communities and our contexts and being creative and innovative with the programs that we put into place. So we do have a couple of, of questions coming in. Um, I think first, um, first I wanna come to Lynette. Um, Lynette, we have a particular question here um, around the inspection for housing units and how has that, how has the inspection kind of changed through the COVID-19 process and, and how you're handling that? 
So um, all Chicago is responsible for um, completing housing inspections for the Department of Family and Support Service Rental Assistance Program or RAP for short. So that's the only program that we currently manage that requires uh, habitability inspection. And after uh, COVID-19 hit and we all started working remotely, uh, we were doing self uh, declarations of habitability with the participants. So we were calling and asking if all of these things function. Well, HUD was okay with that for about two minutes. And then they said, no, we have to figure out a way to have pictures of the units. And especially if uh, these units were built before a certain time, because we had to make certain that if there were children there, that they, um, that there was no lead exposure for those, for those children. So we had to have video cameras. So we did the research, wonderful team. Um, got together and we found uh, this software, co software called Property Inspect. So we can send participants uh, a link to that. And we found out that we could even do it for them if they didn't have the technology or the capability of uploading pictures. And, you know, if they had a government phone, it might not have the capacity to do that. So we found a way through this software to do virtual inspections. And so that's that's been going really well. Um, we, we're up to date and everyone that was approved through DFSS received an inspection and we processed the payment. Fascinating. So it sounds like there was still the requirement to do the unit inspection, but some different technologies and, you know, really just working to be creative and, and partner with the clients to get those inspections through. That's great. Right. Okay, we have, um, I'm happy to welcome um, is it Melissa and Katie to the call. I know it's quite early for you there in Australia. So thank you for joining the call um, and, and for sending over the video. Um, one question for you that's coming through the chat is really around um, the metrics that you're using to evaluate your program and how, how do you um, monitor or measure prevention of homelessness? Yeah, that's a really tricky question. Um, at the start of every school year here in Australia, we conduct a survey in the schools that we're in called the Australian Index of Adolescent Development. Um, and that is sent off, it's all confidential, the young people fill it out. Um, and it's sent off to Upstream Australia who evaluate the data. So, um, and then we, we kind of get a list back that show risk indicators and risk factors for young people. So um, more often than not, it's the risk factors that are identified are um, family conflict and family violence. Uh, they're probably our main risk factors, but it also indicates mental health or, um, uh, what's the other one? AOD. AOD, yeah, um, obviously risk of homelessness is one. Um, yeah, so Upstream Australia do all of the this, the data stuff. So we just do the face-to-face -face practical work in the schools. Those two things go hand in hand, really. The, it's the work really on the do. ground that forms the higher level data. Um, so that's a good uh, segue to my question for Abe. Um, Abe, we've got a lot of folks from around the globe on the, on the line today, and all of the communities are at sort of various points in their data journey. So what advice would you give to a community that, um, you know, maybe has, doesn't have a quote unquote homelessness prevention program yet? How should they um, look at the information that they have to, to begin to think about what kinds of prevention strategies might be appropriate for their community? Yeah, that's a great question. So as we know, uh, and, and actually as a nurse by background, uh, health promotion is a huge part of my work. So we know prevention is, is really hard to measure, right? Because you, you don't know what you're, you're preventing. You, you often only see those who are missed by prevention. Um, so in terms of, of how we think about, you know, what's the information and, and, and then think about, you know, where are our points of impact, um, where we do have uh, often have system information, of course, is through the emergency shelter system. Um, 
we might have pretty good data around our social housing systems. Um, but communities also more and more are getting uh, very good at creating data around things like rough sleeping. And so, you know, in, in communities across Canada in creating by name lists to address uh, kind of to make sure the right folks are getting housing first uh, as quickly as possible. You know, we started to, to really get to know folks at, at street level and, and that's given us pretty good sense of metrics. And, you know, it was really interesting actually in entering the pandemic, um, you, we could tell on a weekly basis uh, in my community of London, how many folks were, were sleeping rough and that, that helped us really think about, you know, what level of offloading of the emergency shelters did we have to do into hotels and motels so that everyone uh, in a tent had an option to come inside if, if they were able and willing. Um, so for sure, I think it's, it's uh, that starting at, at the date of folks who are already in need, that's the easiest point to start to think. Um, because we do, you know, we do know the, the health impacts related to that, all the costs related to uh, chronic homelessness. Uh, as, as we start to move into prevention, um, the, it's thinking about uh, points of connection with the system. And so, um, you know, as, as the folks from Australia were talking about uh, school systems, uh, I know I was, I was uh, in New York and I, I saw a huge focus on schools as homelessness prevention systems in, in New York City. Um, and so that's where you can start to look at your metrics around, um, you know, families in crisis, families in need, and start to connect that kind of deep poverty family crisis uh, with potential homelessness prevention. And it's never gonna be perfect uh, in terms of measuring prevention. Again, you never know exactly uh, what you've achieved, but um, you know, it's, it's when we start to tie our systems together. So we start to, I, I give the example of the healthcare system. Um, and so if we know what's happening in the healthcare system, if we know who's actually achieving uh, a, a housing occupancy because of an intervention at the health system, then we can start to tie that to what's happening in our, our homeless system. So it's, it's when the systems are disconnected to that we have the most trouble, um, you know, being able to kind of measure what we're doing. Yeah, great, great points, Abe. I think we at IGH, we talk a lot about how homelessness is a failure of multiple systems. And I think this is why prevention sometimes feels like such a heavy lift, because we have to be working up and out of our own sector to really identify and understand how, how people are ending up at risk of or experiencing homelessness. Um, so that's tough. Um, Lynette, I'm wondering if you can share with the folks on the line today, um, I know that you collect a, a pretty decent amount of data through the emergency <laughs> fund there, but what are some of the common reasons, the most common reasons that people are requesting financial support for a housing crisis? Well, right now it's uh, job loss. That That is the, the main reason i mean it's it's over 70 percent uh of the reason that you know and you know quite frankly it's, it's because of covid 19. Yeah. Uh, so much of our financial assistance has been relaxed in terms of eligibility criteria because they said well if this hardest hit area was affected because of covid 19 then you can serve this population well 90 percent of the you know population was affected by COVID-19. So um, that has been the number one, number one reason is uh, uh, job loss or, you know, change in family status. And with this COVID, we, we've lost so many people that it's changed the dynamics of the household uh, where there may have been two or three people bringing in income. It may not have, it may have just been enough to cover all of their needs now it's down to two or one in so many instances. Um, and especially when there were seniors that um, may have owned the property. And so now their children or grandchildren are trying to take over their property and the length of time of trying to switch over documentation to prove that they are the rightful owners so that their tenants can pay and use these funds has, has been challenging. 
Uh, one other point uh, I wanted to make, someone had asked about how COVID has affected housing for the better or for worse. I think one of the biggest takeaways so far that we've seen is that we've got to uh, strengthen landlord engagement. We, we've got to bring landlords into the mix to let us know when they go units and, and have focused uh, intentions on, you know, providing housing to those that are most in need and reassuring them that there are services out to support them while they work toward housing stability. We uh, launched the uh, Expedited Housing Initiative uh, during COVID-19 to concentrate on shelters and matching those people that were literally homeless with affordable, affordable housing. So that has, uh, we have a goal of, you know, 2,000 units before the end of the year. So we, we, we are hoping that that is uh, continued to be successful. So I just want to throw that in there. There's been a few moments over this past year where you're just kind of hit with a, a new wave of realization of what this pandemic means to folks who are really kind of living there on the brink. And some of what you said there, Lynette, that's that's another wave for me, just realizing again, you've got multiple wage earners in a household who are past, who've passed away from this and now have to figure out how they're going to remain stably housed. So, yeah. Um, just want to recognize that that sort of moment. Um, so, so many more countries or questions coming in here. Let's let's keep them rolling. Um, Lynette, another question for you around um, how how does emergency financial assistance possibly impact benefit entitlement, um, and how have you managed through that? Well, um, one one good thing is that for like our state homeless prevention program uh, and especially doing, I mean, the COVID is a bad thing, but in, in, in terms of being able to provide quick assistance to households in need, uh, it, it really hasn't had a big impact um, on that because they don't have to prove income right now. So, you know, it's, it's based on uh, the COVID crisis. So if they can verify that, then right now they don't even have to show uh, that they're getting social security benefits or disability benefits or anything like that. So that has been a tremendous lifesaver uh, in addition to not being able to go out to gather this documentation or to help people with uh, applications for different benefits. So we, we really haven't seen um, an impact and I, I don't foresee us uh, having that problem at least through the end of uh, 2022. Great. So some of the loosening of requirements of documentation has really helped people um, access the resource that they need without having to jump through multiple hoops. Let's hope that that continues on yeah. um, even as we come out of this um, pandemic. I, there's been so much conversation globally about how do we build back better and I, I hope that that kind of loosening of restriction, making it easier for folks to access what they need is, is one of those pieces that-, that And, and our funders realize that we also need to move forward to, for stabilization. We can, uh, we can meet the uh, immediate crisis. That's never really been a problem, but never before have we looked at saying, we don't know what the future holds. So if we're able to provide six months and they're currently only behind one month, can we can we pay four months going forward if the cap is six months? And so, you know, we kept pushing and having these conversations um, and uh, they said yes. So now we're able to use the six month uh, assistance for however our case managers and frontline workers see will help stabilize these households. So great. that's been a great thing. Great. Um, question for Melissa and Katie. Um, when you are working with a student and perhaps there's some family violence or something that is making their housing situation very unstable or unsafe, what are some of the tactics that you use? Do you move that student out of the home? Do you work to keep that student in the home? If you could talk a bit about that, that'd be helpful. 
Um, so if we identify any kind of risk like that, we're uh, mandated to report to Child Protection, um, who are, I suppose, um, you'd have a similar similar system um, in all of your countries. So then they kind of take over that risk and go in and investigate um, the, the risk of the child in that home. But we do do a lot of outreach. Our workers can do a lot of outreach. So we, um, I suppose, become a bit creative about how we can still work with that young person if we identify that risk in the home. So um, a lot of our work is place-based where they actually go and sit at the schools. Um, if, you know, a lot of the times our young people's school can be the safest place for them, um, where they feel they can um, uh, say what they need to without anyone kind of listening um, and, and speak freely. So. Um, our workers do um, are allocated a school each and they'll, they'll go to the schools probably twice a week. Um, but we've also got the capacity to even go and pick the young person up from their home or meet them, um, you know, even at McDonald's, um, shout them a frozen coat kind of thing. So it's really flexible in, in the support that we can we can offer. So if that risk is identified, um, mandate a report to job protection, but then also working with the young, the young person um, ongoing and, you know, just obviously not um, uh, work, you know, we probably wouldn't have contact with parents and um, different, we'd put different um, things in place to help support that young person. Great. And we're also really yeah. lucky, or oh, sorry, oh, no, we're go also ahead. really, we're really lucky to also have a family services worker. So Bowen Child Youth and Family, which is the organisation that the Geelong Project sits under, is a really multidisciplinary organisation and we have family services and kindergartens and um, disability services. So we're, we're quite, I suppose, ranged in terms of um, support that we can uh, access. And we have family services. So we actually have a family services worker that sits in our team one day a week um, that brings that skill set. So um, all of our staff, we aim to have them trained in family conflict mediation. So when there is a risk of violence, that's a, that's a no brainer. Keeping young people safe is obviously our first and foremost, you know, priority. But when it's around conflict, and, and we all know, you know, some of the conflict might be around chores or curfews and things like that. So we work with the families and with, it, with the young person at the centre um, and try and eliminate any of the conflict that could result in that young person exiting the home. So we want young people to stay at home. We, that's where we want them to be if it is safe for that to happen. Great. Um, so you've mentioned a, really a variety of different community partnerships, and it seems to me that you're kind of in the in the center of that hub with the student trying to access all these different resources and, and ways to keep that, um, that student stable and continuing to come to school. Is that a fair, fair assessment? Most yeah, definitely. Great. And yeah. what are some of the other community-based partnerships you, you have in the mix? So we have, um, so within TGP, we've got our family services. We also have a mental health early intervention worker. Um, we work really closely, obviously, with the schools. Um, so their mental health workers, their wellbeing support staff. We have um, our local headspace, which, which is a, 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 a support for young people who have mental health concerns. So we utilise them a fair bit. Um, and then we have the rest. So we use our local government, the city of Greater Geelong, um, in terms of young people accessing group work and holiday programs and things like that. Um, we also have private psychologists and psychiatrists that we use, equine therapists that we use. Um, we work closely with the Department of Education. So and their Navigator program, which is a program for young people who have got um, attendance rate lower than 30%. Um, it, it's not limited, you know, we, whatever the young person needs, we find and, and we try and accommodate to the best of our ability. So um, each young person could have a care team wrapped around them around homelessness, mental health, family work, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's, I want to say unlimited, there's obviously some limits, but, you know, we, we try and accommodate to the best, 
we can. It sounds like you've got a lot in your toolkit that you can use to, to give that student the support that they really need. And, you know, I think that's true, whether you're thinking about um, prevention or whether you're thinking about serving someone who is homeless with complex needs, it's, there's, there's no one answer. I think this was even in the video. There's no one size fits all approach. It has to be really tailored. And, and Abe, that kind of came up um, in your presentation as well at the, at the community level. And Abe, I'm wondering if there are any examples from um, your research or your, your knowledge of homeless programs in, in Canada where you've seen um, uh, an organization that's so well connected that they can provide somebody with really everything that they need to be successful and stable? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, the, the one that comes to mind or a couple that come to mind are some of the youth serving organizations, uh, I think of how they've developed really complex uh, network of services attached to one or organization. And so you'll have uh, some, uh, an organization that provides everything from education uh, for students who've been streamed into accommodated education, to employment, to family reconnection, maybe on-site housing, maybe off-site housing support. Um, so I do think, you know, from what I've seen, and, and this isn't just within our country, I think this is um, around the world starting to see work uh, such as like the Away Home uh, work where you've really got an organization that's set up to, to kind of address all the determinants of, of housing uh, kind of in, in one place. Um, I mean, the challenge that often comes with that though, like in, in communities, mid-sized communities in Canada, for example, is that then the youth organization is often the, the sole player in town. Um, and of course, what happens in that scenario is that, that youth who do become then uh, maybe disaffiliated with that one organization, uh, then then kind of see gaps in, in opportunities. But yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, organizations like Youth Opportunities Unlimited um, jumps out at me and, uh, and others who are again connected with the Away Home um, are, are ones that that have really figured out how, how to do that wrap around so that you're keeping keeping youth in school really a, a preventative model of um, you know helping secure a first rent um, or helping reconnect maybe with uh, to, with an aunt or something to prevent a, a homelessness experience. Great, thank you. I I think our sector is still kind of moving from an older model where you tried to have a massive NGO that provided all things to all people. And now we're moving towards more, you know, NGOs that maybe focus on a certain population, whether that's um, veterans who are experiencing homelessness or something similar. Um, and so having those links and those networks to other organizations that focus on mental health or physical health are becoming more and more um, important. Uh, Lynette, I'm going to come back to you because I know, um, full disclosure everyone, Lynette and I used to work together when I worked at, at All Chicago and so I can really put her on the spot today, um, but I know that the emergency fund model is a highly networked one and so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the structure that, that you've got in place um, with the different fund managers at different organizations and, and how people kind of come to access the fund. Sure. Um, so yes, we uh, have been partnering with uh, key stakeholders and agencies, nonprofits, social service agencies, the city um, for as long as the, when the emergency fund was just partnering with uh, 80 or 60 some partners to distribute funds that we raised private dollars for. This was before we took on um, so many of the government grants and we were doing more crisis aversion. So we still had that program and that is for smaller ticket things like, like I said before, transportation or uh, someone needs glasses because they haven't had their eyes tested in forever or a uniform or food or things that aren't covered under homeless, typical homeless prevention uh, programs. So we partner uh, with agencies across Chicago 
that um, do more than just throw funds at a situation. So they provide counseling, employment, uh, health services, mental health strategies, just uh, domestic violence, just the gambit of things that they work with. And for those partners, we raise the funds internally and we send them what we call in a, a monthly allotment based on the size of their organization, their capacity to distribute the funds. So we put the ownership in their hands to determine uh, immediately what, what the community and, and the people that are coming to them may need. So they may get just $800 to $1,200 a month. And they set the cap at about $300 to $500 max. And they can buy beds and household items, all kinds of things. Um, and so clients can either be engaged in one of their programs or they can be referred from the Homeless Prevention Call Center, which will do the screening and send them an email saying, hey, this person needs a bed. They just moved out of homelessness and they will serve them. They send us a monthly report and we put that into our database to share, you know, crisis assistance, homeless prevention with that. But for most of our larger uh, grants, government grants specifically for homeless prevention, we partner with, um, we currently have 10 partners across the city for our state homeless prevention program. And we vet them as well, see for uh, capacity, financial stability, the whole nine yards. We train them on the eligibility requirements set by the state, uh, how to review applications, how to uh, submit payments to us, and uh, how to use our database, our homeless management information system, where we put all of that information in. And then we, uh, they also can serve clients that come from the community or from the call center. So we rely on the call center a lot uh, to have a central access for people looking for services, but we also rely on them as being right there in the heart of the communities to, to serve clients that, that may be um, in need. We process the payments for, for them um, and then we send them directly to vendors, uh, landlords uh, as payment. And uh, we report back to the state on the outcomes, on our financial uh, uh, expenditures and distributions and the demographics for the households that we serve. Great. I, I think this, just this idea of having to be hugely networked is, is such an important one because we all know it to be true. No one agency can end homelessness on our own. It's going to take so many partners at the table, so many players. And I think um, the sector is, is really moving positively in that direction. Um, and we'll need to do that even more to work upstream and reach up into these other, other systems. So um, we have really just one time for one more question. Um, Abe, this one is coming to you. Oh, it looks like it might've been answered already. Um, but actually, if you want to say that, uh, say that out loud for folks, a um, question around how to identify diversionary points for hidden populations of people at risk of homelessness, for example, older women. Yeah, for sure. So I just, I just replied to that one is, this is where that lived experience knowledge is so, so vital. Uh, there's a program uh, called Street Level Women at Risk, for example, that's working to support housing precarity for uh, street level sex workers who, of course, they're a hidden population, but not only that, they're like, they're intentionally hidden for survival, right? And so uh, it's it's the women themselves who, as part of a, a leadership network, are, are creating solutions for, for their housing. And so any population, you know, we're just starting a project with Indigenous youth here, um, and, and it's going to be really listening to them to hear about, you know, in moments of crisis, what did they wish that they had had, what, what would have worked for them. So um, it's, it's, that's definitely the, the trick for that hidden population is that uh, talk to the, the experts with the lived experience or living experience um, to, to hear from them what, what they wish they had, had had and when and how they, they would have accessed that for sure. Great, thank you. Um, so, so many, I think, themes from this conversation for us to take away and think about and think about how we apply in our own communities, um, data and research, um, understanding what's going on in our community, what the context is, and then tailoring 
not only to our community, but also to the individual that we are serving, um, being networked, having broad community-based partnerships. Um, also, you know, understanding, I, I thought this was key in what Lynette said too, we can't just throw money at a problem. We need to make sure that people are surrounded with the types of services that are going to um, get them stable or keep them stable. Um, so it's not the money alone that, that ends homelessness. It's not the roof alone that ends homelessness. Um, and then, you know, the, the importance of partnering and really listening to people who have the, the lived expertise to make sure we're bringing that perspective, um, probably the most important perspective into the conversation around solutions. So to our panelists, thank you so much. We appreciated you being here, particularly the ones who got up so early in the morning. Um, and likewise to our to our attendees, I know we had uh, just about 100 people registered for this from all different time zones. So we will be posting um, the recording of this to our website along with some additional resources um, like Abe's research, some research that was done on Lynette's Emergency Financial Assistance Program um, and all sorts of things. So you're on our email list. We will get those resources to you. And um, we really look forward to seeing you on our next Community of, of Impact webinar. Julia, is there any other closing comments we have for the group today? No, I think that's it. Um, thank you to all the panelists and for everyone to, uh, joining. And it was a pleasure learning more about prevention strategies. Yes. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.